So I see we're talking about Robocop today. Uh-huh. The beautiful remake film. F*** off. <laughs> Talk about 1982 Robocop, man. Let's roll. The best Robocop. Perhaps no character in fiction has ever died as hard as Mr. Kinney does in Robocop. A character who, for anyone who doesn't remember, is shot like 80,000 times in the chest, face and penis by a bipedal robot with gun hands. A death, it turns out, was nowhere near violent enough for director Paul Verhoeven, who called the actor playing Kinney back in just to shoot him again. It's been a while since I've watched Robocop. Who was Kinney? Well, he's the guy who gets shot by Edge 209, if you remember the introduction, Brad. And if you don't have like the IMDB page of Robocop commit to memory like I do, um, Kinney was played by an actor called Kevin Page, who is a prolific extra and TV actor, whose most notable role is that of the guy who gets blown the fuck away in Robocop, which is glorious and I love it. To be fair, it's a good thing to have on your CV, isn't that it? That is an amazing thing to have on your CV. And apparently Kevin Page fucking loves that he's the guy who got blown away by Ed 209. That's like his most famous role. And every now and again on like his Twitter and his actual website, he'll just post pictures of himself from behind the scenes. Like, oh, here I am after like the 45th squib went off. <laughs> just giving a big old goofy thumbs up. He fucking loves it, man. Do you know my absolute favourite thing, though, about like Kevin Page's role was Mr. Kinney in Robocop? Yeah. That was his first ever acting gig. That was like his first foray into the world of acting. He turned up like bright-eyed and bushy-tailed on his first day of shooting. So, Mr. Verhoeven, really nice to work with you. Loved your previous work. What do you want me to do? Lie down on that table and we're going to blow you the fuck away. It's like, you see those squibs over there and those squibs there and then that 300 squibs over there, you're putting all them on. Go lie down on that table. And he's like, yes, sir, Mr. Verhoeven, sir. So, he, oh man, what an acting gig that is. I love it. It's great. Well, it's definitely a good one to have. Like, it's not, but like, he, as did, he, did get, yeah, he did get to act alongside like, Ronnie Cox, who's fucking awesome. Like, who obviously plays Dick Jones in the movie. Mr. Kenny. Yes, sir. Would you come up and give his hand, please? Yes, sir. So, it's not like he didn't have good acting experience. It's just great that his very first acting role is he's a character you know is not coming back in the sequel. <laughs> oh, I've got the script. Where's mine? He flips over one page. Oh. <laughs> As an aside, because I love Ronnie Cox and I love the story behind his casting, I always assumed that, because obviously my first experience with him as an actor is the film Robocop, he's a character actor who just plays evil dickish CEOs. It's like, no, it was the exact opposite. Paul Verhoeven cast him specifically because prior to that, he'd only played nice guys on TV. And you better find, like, see if you find like, an early clip of him in something like before Robocop, where he's just playing a nice guy. And he said, it'd be funny to get this guy who's mostly known as being like a super nice guy in all of his films and TV shows. It's just an arsehole CEO. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he owns the role really well. So that's really good casting right there, man. Ronnie Cox. He's <laughs> <laughs> so looking, he's just evil. He's so evil. It's evil as hell. He's so evil looking, he's old Ronnie Cox. It's great. It's like Clarence Bodica. It's the guy, like, Clarence Bodica, like the main bad guy. He later went and played the, the dad from fucking set that 70s show. The reason that bad things happen to you is because you're a dumbass. <laughs> I love that 70s show. Like, Kurt Wood Smith is a fucking fantastic actor. But the idea that he went from playing like this super evil drug dealing murderer to just like a nice dad on that 70s show. It's great. I love you, Kurt Wood Smith. Never stop. You probably don't think I'm a very nice guy. Buddy, I think you're slime. <laughs> Moving back to the death of Mr. Kinney, the story goes that when he was watching an early cut of the movie, director Paul Verhoeven didn't think the death was gory enough in comparison to some of the other death scenes in the film. Which is a fair point, considering in this movie there is a guy who gets all of his flesh melted off by acid and is then exploded when he gets hit by a car travelling to Mach 3. <laughs> And also another scene in which the titular Robocop shoots the guy's penis off. <laughs> because it's going to get mentioned a bunch of times, I'm aware of the fact there is that stupid scene someone filmed from the My Robocop movie, where they remade that scene and Robocop shoots like 40 different people in the penis. We're not putting a clip of that in because we're going to get it demonetized immediately. I'm aware it exists though, don't mention it in the comments. I know it's a thing. So what did Verhoeven do about this? What he did is, at great expense, rebuilt the entire OCP office set and then brought Kevin Page back in. And he even went as far as to bring Ed 209 back in as well so you get more reaction shots of the robot shooting him. And then proceeded to just load Page up with squibs and then just film him getting shot some more. 
Paige would say like, yeah, two months after filming Wrapped, I assume obviously my job's done. And I got a phone call saying, we need you back in for reshoots. He didn't realize how literal, obviously, that statement was until he turned up for the day. But holy shit, what a great phone call for that guy. And the best part is, well, like, Paige is really proud of that because he said, like, they loaded me up with about 200 squibs, which I believe is a record. I'm not sure if the record still stands, but he maintains that's a record uh, for filming at the time for amount of squibs attached to a single actor. <laughs> While this did result in a far more impressive death scene for Paige's character, Verhoeven was still not convinced it was as violent as it could be, and tasked the effects crew with making it so Paige's character died just that little bit harder. How did they go about doing this? Well, the effects crew found their solution in the form of spaghetti, which apparently they were eating on the day of filming for lunch, and they went, hang on a sec, this looks kind of like guts. So what they did is they dressed up Paige back in his character's costume again, rebuilt the set again, cleaned up all the blood, loaded him up with even more squibs and then shoved a load of spaghetti and fake blood up his shirt and then lied him down again and then had Ed 209 shoot him a few more times and then got that shot. Which apparently sated Paul Verhoeven's bloodlust. <laughs> because obviously the shot now looked like his guts had just been ripped out of his body by the squibs because you just see bits of flesh or appears to be flesh flying out all over the joint and it looks awful. Like, I'm sorry if anyone was squeamish but we've got to put these clips in to demonstrate what we're talking about. But oh my god, does that look horrific. It's so fucking bad. Unfortunately though, which is the annoying part, they did dramatically cut Kinney's like, death scene. So uh, that's why there are two versions of Robocop. There's like the, the regular cut, theatrical cut, and the director's cut. And the director's cut has got all that footage put back in. And it's a real shame because obviously if you watch the theatrical cut, you don't really get the same like, um, feeling from the film. Because the whole point of Kinney's death scene being so fucking violent is it's supposed to juxtapose the line delivered immediately after it by the old man of, I'm very disappointed in you. Dick, I'm very disappointed. Because it's like, the, the ju that's it, you're laughing at it now, thinking about it, the juxtaposition of a guy getting absolutely fucking blown away. And it's like, here are pieces of his body being flung into the air by these high-powered organ-detonating rifle rounds being fired by this giant robot. It just smash cuts to this old man going, I'm very disappointed. And there's another line in that which I feel gets overshadowed a bit. Delivered by an extra off-camera where they go, Oh my God, someone call an ambulance! Somebody want to call a goddamn paramedic? Let's go, Johnson! And that joke's kind of lost if he only gets shot once or twice. You think, oh yeah, definitely call an ambulance. He's been shot. But when you see him get, there's like a full 10 second clip where you see Ed 209 continuing to shoot his obviously dead corpse. And he smash goes away, call an ambulance. <laughs> what do you mean call an ambulance? And that was lost on theatrical audiences. They didn't get that joke, which is a shame. Finally, because I kind of have to mention this, according to Paige, several of the squibs that were placed on his body were located dangerously close to his penis. If anyone doesn't know what squibs are, he describes it as basically being like little firecrackers. So, when the time came to film the scene where he's shot several more times by Ed 209, all of those squibs next to his dong went off at once, and he would later report that it felt like he was being kicked in the nuts repeatedly for 30 seconds straight. Which just goes to show that one, Kevin Page is a fucking good actor, and two, Calculon was lying about corpse acting being hard. I've seen better acting from- No wait, uh, about it being easy. For fuck's sake, I had that line straight away. Damn it, put the clip in. No, 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 I don't do two takes. Robocop is an invincible sentinel of cyborg justice. He's incorruptible, bulletproof, and can shoot a criminal in the dick from about a mile away. Something no better proven than by that scene in the original Robocop movie, where the titular Robocop walks through a factory full of drug dealers and blows every single one of them away with pinpoint accurate shots to the body and dick. A scene I'm now about to make infinitely cooler by telling you that the actor playing Robocop was listening to a soft rock ballad while all that was happening. So, as we both know, yes. literally everybody watching this video will have seen Robocop. They better have done. If you're a fan of Fact Fiend, you're a fan of Robocop. But seeing as it's quite an old film, just in case they watched it when it was first released. Like I did. As even we both though, obviously yeah, did, yeah. Even though it was released before I was born. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to maybe explain what's happening in that scene? Well, in that particular scene, Robocop learns that a big old drug deal's going down, and he decides to bust the fuck in there and get his John Woo on. I think he looks like he's getting his John Wick on. No, because John Wick looks at people and he shoots them. Robocop doesn't. He's one step removed from, like, hard-boiled, where he's got Chow Yun-Fat sliding down a banister firing two pistols, and he's a robot. 
That scene always reminds me of like playing Time Crisis in an arcade. Oh man, because you can see Robocop just pulling off trick shots because it's like, you know what? I know I'm better than these guys. Let's just show off a little bit. And I love how you see Robocop having I mean, underarm shots and stuff like that. And it is basically a light gun shooter at that point. I don't think we ever got a Robocop light gun shooter. And it's kind of upsetting. That we, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'd love to play that game. But to my knowledge, there was ever one released. And I think that'd be awesome, because I miss light gun shooters. Bring back light gun shooters, because those things were awesome. Robocop kills so many people in that scene. And I love how hilariously easy he seems to find it, as evidenced by the fact he starts doing trick shots halfway through. <laughs> My favourite bit about that entire scene is that he reserves, like, you know, just like the hand-to-hand -hand, uh, ass whooping for Clarence fucking Bodica. Ah! As an aside, for people who might not know this, that scene was actually screened to a bunch of police officers because the producers were genuinely worried that they might object to the content contained therein. But Carl, I don't see anything wrong with that scene. Yeah, it's just a scene of like, you know, a supposedly perfect robotic police officer viciously violating a criminal's basic human rights by beating him half to death while reading him his Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. What like, police officer could ever find fault with that? And that's what the producers thought. thought oh shit, if we show a, like, you know, quote unquote, perfect police officer beating a criminal in this manner while reading his rights, they might think that's a bit crass. So they screened an early cut of Robocop to a bunch of police officers. And I believe after the fact, they handed out a few questionnaires to ask these police officers, like what specifically they thought of the scene and police officers loved it. And I think one of the quotes is, I might be misremembering this, you might have to track it down, is, oh, it's really great to see Robocop doing something we can't. And that's a quote on sticking people's minds, you know, while the next time you see a story in the news about police brutality, that police in the 80s saw Robocop beating a criminal half to death and got semi-chubs on thinking about, oh man, I'd love it if I could do that to criminals. <laughs> that's kind of terrifying, that, isn't it? That actual police officers were like rubbing their knees going, yeah! fucking beat that criminal Robocop. And I get it, we as an audience who aren't police officers see that and go, oh yeah, that's Robocop getting his revenge on the guy who killed him. But for a police officer to go, oh man, it's so good to see a police officer just violate the basic tenant of the justice system to beat the shit out of this dude. It's like, come on guys, don't say that out loud. Don't let Paul Verhoeven hear you say that. Oh, so yeah, that scene made it in with no cuts. Because they thought, oh, well, if police officers don't mind Robocop just fucking this guy's shit up, we'll put it in. <sighs> Moving back to the drug scene, the sheer amount of blanks being fired around or at Robocop necessitated the actor wearing the Robocop suit, Peter Weller, to wear headphones to protect his ears. So is this where the soft rock ballad comes into it? Yes, it does. Because you see, um, originally Peter Weller was just offered like a pair of like, you know, earplugs or something like that to like drown out the noise of the blanks. But he discovered midway through filming that a pair of Walkman headphones fit perfectly underneath the Robocop helmet. So he opted to wear those instead and just played music to drown out the sound of all the blanks firing. Out of interest, do we know the exact song he was listening to? We do, Brad, because I do my fucking research, people. According to Peter Weller, I think in an interview with the AV Club, he revealed that the song he was listening to during that particular scene was Peter Gabriel's Red Rain. You can probably guess what I'm going to ask you to do now, can't you, Brad? Yeah, I've been doing this long enough now. Yeah, can you please edit together some shots from that scene of Robocop blowing people away with twirling gun combos and set it to Peter Gabriel's Red Rain so we can experience that scene the way Robocop did? So this story on its own is pretty amazing, but I remember when I first heard it thinking what that means for the Robocop universe. So I remember finding myself thinking, does Robocop play music when he's doing this? Because obviously, like I mentioned, those headphones fit underneath the Robocop helmet. And in the Robocop movie, we see that that helmet can be removed. And you can see, like, like Alex Murphy's face and ears underneath it. So technically, Robocop, the character, could wear headphones and listen to music while blowing away bad guys. But my personal headcanon is that Robocop is constantly playing music no matter what he does. So are we assuming he's wearing the headphones under the helmet or has he got built-in music playing inside his uh, 
Because well, I imagine him like inside a really boring meeting, he just starts playing music. Yeah, because his brain is computer, isn't it? Yeah. And there's nothing to stop him like putting Windows Media Player up and just like, you know, <laughs> just playing Peter Gabriel's Red Rain whenever the fuck he wants, because his brain is a computer. And I'm just now thinking, imagine Robocop after a hard day of being a kick-ass police officer, punching people through windows and shooting bad guys in the dick. He sits down in that stupid robo chair and he edits together the best scenes <laughs> to music like he's making a Halo 3 headshot montage. <laughs> it's stupid, but we, it, he has the ability to do that. And I'm just thinking, what song would Robocop pick to set all his headshots to? Because it'd have to be Linkin Park's Crawling, wouldn't it? Do you reckon he'd have loads of subs who are like interested in the fighting videos and then he does the occasional one where he's like making dinner and everyone's like fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> he accidentally uploads when he's like, you know, just going to a meeting, filling in paperwork. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh no, like Robocop's balls exposed on stream. <laughs> and he's up like, he uploads the Clarence Bodica video when he's doing it. It's like Clarence Bodica gets bodied. <laughs> <laughs> he's got like Robocop's face with a red circle around Clarence Bodica as he's thrown through the window and it's Robocop going like ah <laughs> and then it's like you know, those um, YouTubers who tell like stupid obviously made up stories like I was almost kidnapped he's like Robocop saying I shot off a rapist peen <laughs> no but Robocop saying I got, sh I got shot to death <laughs> just replaying his own death and he's no Robocop's reaction to his own death <laughs> <laughs> it's like the shot of Clarence Bonica about to blow his head off. And then it's like him, Robocop, doing that in the thumbnail. <laughs> Robocop reacts is a whole new series. <laughs> like videos emerging him doing stuff he wasn't supposed to. Like, that sh like have you seen that um, advert where <laughs> Robocop steals a Korean family's fridge? <laughs> and people find that and it's like, oh man, Robocop seems to me. He has to do like an apology video. With like soft music in the background and crying on the camera. And then he gets in trouble because obviously he's showing dead bodies on YouTube and he has to box KSI. <laughs> <laughs> My god, there's so much good imagery in that in that like, cl tangent. Close, close off the video and let's oh. talk about this a bit more. Okay, yeah. So if you ever want to watch Robocop again and want to make that scene infinitely cooler, just play Peter Gabriel's Red Rain in the background because that is the song Robocop himself was listening to as he shot all those bad guys in the dick. <sighs> Brad, I think we're onto something with Robocop being a YouTuber. We've got, we're onto some shit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon he'd get the YouTuber hair when he paints it onto his helmet? Like when he takes the Robocop helmet off, he's just got like a shit lid and he's just dyed pink or some shit. <laughs> and he's playing Fortnite. <laughs> oh and, and then people in the comments start bitching at him for selling. No, people <laughs> bitching for aimbotting because he's a computer and he can <laughs> even play Fortnite too well. Would he get banned? Because is he technically, because he is like, he is a bot. He is a robot, yeah. He might get banned. And then they make a video about it. I got banned from Fortnite for being too good. <laughs> Do you reckon he gets sponsorships and have to put him on his armour? <laughs> he looks like a fucking NASCAR driver. <laughs> Just Robocop shilling for fucking Audible. <laughs> Just Robocop shilling for Dollar Shave Club. <laughs> but he hasn't got skin. <laughs> And then, oh, what would be his catchphrase? It'd be, uh, stay out of trouble. Do you know when he signs off his videos, he does the Robocop quotes of, stay out of trouble. Do you reckon if he'd, he'd do, like, when he calls someone out on YouTube, you know, they have those battles, and at the end he goes, your move, creep. <laughs> and then he's doing like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> Hollywood, if you're watching, feel free to steal this one, because, oh, my, I will pay money to watch Robocop try and use Facebook. <laughs> and he's got to use, like, the data spike, but he can't fit it in the USB port. Do you reckon you have to get new attachments now? Oh, oh man, that'd be awful. Like, <laughs> Robocop 95, and it's in it. It's like, Robocop 95, and it's going to go to Robocop XP. <laughs> oh, my God, that's a fucking money idea right there, man. That's a fucking good one. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh. Okay, so, Brad, as per usual, would you like to explain to the wonderful people at home what the topic of today's video is specifically? Well, anyone who's watched a lot of videos on the channel will know that Carl fucking loves Robocop. We're just going to do a focus for Carl. This is really, and the audience. Nice for Carl to talk about the hidden meanings and depth in Robocop that people who watched it initially didn't realise. Yeah, and this includes both just like casual viewers of movies and fucking movie critics because 
You watched the movie yesterday in preparation for this video, correct? I watched one, two, three, and the reboot, Carl. So you watched Robocop yesterday for the purpose <laughs> of this video. We might mention the sequels, you never know. Maybe the reboot if we get into it. From talking to me, you've noticed some of those little hidden details, but even just as a casual fan of Robocop and action movies, can you believe that when that movie was released, people thought it was 100% serious? No. For anyone who doesn't know what we mean by that, the film is 100% satire, as evidenced by all of the satirical elements contained therein, such as the one that you uh, mentioned before we started filming, the cutaways that they have throughout the original three Robocop movies. And what about them made you like, realise, oh yeah, this is clearly taking the piss? Because they're just so like over the top and daft. Yeah, it is a, a, a hyper exaggerated version of the world. Like for example, the idea of Robocop itself is so ridiculous, I can't believe people like took it seriously. Like critics at the time thought, oh, it's, it's, it's a dumb action movie. Why would anyone watch this? And even Paul Verhoeven, the director originally, wrote off the entire fucking movie as a joke when he read the title for the film, Robocop. Like, I'm not directing this piece of shit, I'm Paul Verhoeven. And the story goes, his wife literally pulled the draft of the script out of the trash, read it and went, Paul, I think there's some depth here that a skilled director can uncover, like you. And he went back and he read it and went, oh, it's not just a dumb action movie. Like, the name Robocop belies a lot of depth in the movie. Like, this is a struggle for a man to like, assert himself when he's trapped inside a robotic body. A robot cop, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> and just so many people thought it was serious, including critics. Like, and this might be my educational background making me sound like an elitist asshole, but I am so baffled that that's the case. Because the opening of the movie, Brad, what happens at the opening of the movie? He goes in a big car chase in which he leans out of a window while firing two pistols at once from about that far away from an army of guys with shotguns who open fire on the windscreen while missing. <laughs> and compare that to like five minutes later in the movie when Alex J. Murphy is just getting torn apart by those same shotguns. Like That opening scene would be the ending, the penultimate action scene of another, like, of a generic action movie, which is what people thought Robocop was. Because it shows the hero just completely immune to all bullets in the world, firing two guns in the most inefficient manner possible. I don't understand how people can watch that scene and not realise there's, there's something about this that's not meant to be taken seriously. Yeah, like the fact that you have a guy at point blank range firing a shotgun into the windscreen of the car and missing. The purpose of that scene is to make you think that Alex J. Murphy is invincible. He is the traditional invincible action hero man that you see in a generic action movie, which is why the surprise of him getting blown to bits five minutes later is so visceral. The main character of action movies in the 80s did not get his head blown off by a guy with glasses and a shit haircut. And again, like, let's speak about Clarence Boddicker, the guy who like, eliminates Alex J. Murphy. What do you think of his design? I mean, he looks like a villain. He looks like a villain, yeah, but specifically, did he like, you know, evoke the imagery of anyone in particular to you? Just think about his glasses, his little round glasses, little bald head. It's Heinrich Himmler. Is that who it's supposed to be? Yeah. He's, like, they gave him glasses to like, make him look more like Heinrich Himmler, you know, the guy who was a big old Nazi. And again, people thought this film was serious. We've talked so much about Robocop in the past that a lot of these things that I never noticed now, watching back through yesterday, I've seen. Yeah. Like the whole idea of him being an allegory for Jesus. Yeah, when you know to look out for them, that sounds really stupid. There's no Jesus allegory in Robocop, Carl. Shut up. No, go watch the movie back or watch the scenes we're going to put in and see that, oh look, here's a scene of Robocop walking on water. Like, think about it, Alex Murphy dies and he's resurrected a few days later, comes back and murders everybody. I'm sure if they retold the Bible today, <laughs> that is what Jesus would do. <laughs> Just Robo Christ. Oh man, that'd be amazing. And that's basically what it is. And again, like critics at the time didn't notice this. And I have got serious doubts in the ability of those critics to review movies if they look at a guy walking on water after being resurrected and say there's no imagery here. There's no deeper meaning behind this. It's so fucking obvious. There is so much cool shit people don't notice on a first watch of this film. Like, what would you like to have me talk about the depth and like hidden intricacies of now? What about the suit? The story behind the suit is it's made by Rob Boutine, um, who was the guy who did most of the practical effects for The Thing and a couple of the movies that we've talked about before. And the original actor slated to play Robocop was one Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> which would have been <laughs> fucking awesome. But 
Arnold Schwarzenegger is a very big like, is a very big man, and they said, well, if we put him inside the suit, it's going to look stupid. He's going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger with bits of plastic bolted to him. What we need is a thin man who we can put inside, so he looks like a man trapped inside a robotic body. So they only got Peter Weller. My favourite part of the Robocop design is when they take off the mask and you see Alex Murphy's face stretched over a metal skeleton. That effect, to me, holds up today and is arguably one of the singular greatest practical effects ever because it is fucking seamless. So for anyone out there who isn't like me and read all the supplementary background material for Robocop, Robocop has almost no human parts left. They even make a joke about that. It's like, Morton says, I want full body prosthesis. Like the face of Robocop is Alex Murphy's face. And they say in the second one, they made it as a gift to Alex Murphy. And they, the reason they did that is because they said, if we put his brain into a robot body and he looked in a mirror and he didn't see a man staring back at him, his mind would just fucking explode because like the human mind is not built to like, you know, just comprehend that. So they put the face, so Robocop had a human face to look into a mirror and see. And behind that robot face, there is no human components whatsoever. It is all robotic. He has a completely indestructible robot skull. And that's why shooting Robocop in the face doesn't work. So are there any other elements of Robocop you want me to break down and explain the hidden depth behind them when on the surface to a casual viewer, they do look kind of dumb? I remember you saying something about Ed 209, like he's got more to him than meets the eye. There is, yeah. And the most obvious is that he's supposed to be inefficient by design. And the idea behind Ed 209 being pushed for military use despite the fact it doesn't fucking work is basically the plot of every Metal Gear game and that is that it's all about funding the war economy it's about making money it's not about whether or not it works or not and that's why like Robocop triumphs over Ed 209 and there's a load of cool things in the design of Ed 209 that I quite like the first is the grill on the front the grill on the front of Ed 209 do you know what function that serves in the behind the scenes material Nothing. No, that, you're absolutely right yeah. there. It doesn't serve any purpose whatsoever. They actually put it on to make Ed 209 look cool. And they say that in the supplementary material because it's a nod to the fact that in the 80s, a lot of car manufacturers will put fake grills on the front of cars to make them look more powerful. And they do the same thing with Ed 209 because people think it looks cool. And the most blatant thing in the movie that showcases that Ed 209 was designed for intimidation and to look cool, more than functionality is the fact it can't walk down fucking stairs. <laughs> Even though Robocop himself kind of can't walk down stairs. How do they get it up the stairs? Oh, they put it, up, it, it comes up the lift. Was it? It comes up the lift, yes. Right. But then tries to follow him down the stairs. Yeah, because he doesn't realise that he can't walk down stairs. <laughs> They have that moment unironically in the 2014 reboot when they make Robocop tactical black. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah, let's make him look black so it looks cool, even though it serves no purpose. Like, this is the exact thing they did with Ed 209, and that's why Ed 209 sucks ass, and you're doing it with Robocop, you fucking idiot. I have mentioned something to you before, haven't I, about the Robocop soundtrack. The Robocop theme is potentially one of my favourite pieces of music from a movie because the Robocop theme is representative of Robocop himself. It starts with orchestral elements, strings, something natural, something human made, like Alex Murphy. And then in the background, the percussion kicks in, but the percussion is an anvil, something robotic, something artificial, machinery, industry that's getting added to the organic elements already present, just like fucking Robocop. And initially, those two bits, they don't fit together. But as the theme builds to a crescendo, the inorganic parts and the organic parts start to work together, just like Robocop does when he realises, I might be part machine, but I'm also part man and part fucking cop. And then it all comes together like, da -da 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 -da, as he's stomping through a fucking warehouse, shooting criminals in the dick forever. Robocop's the fucking best, man, I love it. Within the context of the universe he exists in, Robocop is an unkillable, cybernetically enhanced badass with an unflinching devotion to the law and a penchant for uppercutting people through plate glass windows. Something he's apparently only able to do thanks to his best and yet least known ability, his super Catholicism. Okay, so there might be some people who don't know about Robocop. I know, and I don't know why they're fans of his channel, because we talk about it all the time, but I guess we should clarify what Robocop is. Because the name is a little bit of a misnomer because he's not a robot. Although he is a cop, yeah. so it's a bit confusing. He's actually, I think, more akin to a cyborg. And a recurring, ever-present theme throughout a lot of Robocop-related media is, like, what is Robocop? Is he a man? Is he a machine? Is he something in between? And that's something that 
the man inside the machine, Alex Murphy, who was a police officer who just gets so, so wrecked by just multiple shotguns. Oh, yeah, that scene where he's just stood and he's just taking all these bullets. Goes, oh, God, it's... it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> he's like, for a minute, just stood there for a minute. It's so it. harsh. That scene is unbelievable. Like, he gets shot about 10,000 times. <laughs> it when they shot his hand off. I know it's not they, real, they to, yeah. but I was just like, ugh. Doesn't it feel real because of the practical effects? Because that'd be CGI these days. Yeah, Alex Murphy, for lack of a more nuanced term, gets all kinds of fucked up. And Nisha, I take it that you recently watched Robocop? I watched it a few weeks ago. And did the version you watched include the scene where Robocop gets shot through the head? Yes. And did you get to see the back of his head blown out? Yeah. Okay, because that's cut out of the theatrical cut. And I think that ruins the movie because like in the um, theatrical cut, you don't get to see that. So all you see is like, you know, Alex Murphy gets shot a few times and it's somewhat believable that maybe you could bring him back to life with cybernetics. But when you get to see the shot of the entire back of his head getting blown out, um, the question of is Robocop even a human anymore yeah. starts to make more sense because there's so little left of him. And there's a line in the movie where they're arguing about does Robocop have any rights? Where they just say, if we laid out all the pieces of you on a table, there wouldn't even be enough for a corpse. And that's so fucking harsh. And it's like, oh God, and you can see why Robocop struggles with immortality. And as much as I hate the 2014 reboot, there is one really good part of that movie. And it is where Alex Murphy's in the Robocop suit and he asks them, what do I actually look like? What's even left? And they separate away all the robot parts. And there's literally a set of lungs, his head, and then the most annoying part, one hand. Just one <laughs> hand, like, oh, I hate that bit. But ignoring that bit with the one hand, you just see, and then he just immediately just breaks down because he can't physically comprehend what has happened to him. Yeah. And he, I think he actually starts crying. This is a neat little feature out of one eye because the other side of his face got blown off. Something went wrong. And he says to like, Gary Oldman, never show me like this again. I never want to see myself in this situation. So what about the uh, original Robocop? Is there much left of him? There's even less than that's left in the 2014 reboot because they take out everything that isn't you know, useful. Yeah. I think he has a heart. He has a rudimentary digestive system, uh, which they acknowledge and they say he has to eat this paste. Uh, this basically sustains the few organic parts left. Um, his face isn't real. You think the fake? No. Yeah, because in Robocop 2, he says that they made it to honor Alex Murphy. Okay. So the face wasn't real. They just like took it and tried to repair it as best they can. Yeah. And you can even see the bullet hole from when he gets the, uh, the back of his head blown out being like, you know, just smoothed over with like rubber and cement. It's like, oh, oh. so even his face isn't real. His eyes aren't real. Yeah. Uh, his teeth aren't real. And so, Joe, the thing people say, oh, why don't they shoot Robocop in the face? It wouldn't work because he doesn't even have a human skull anymore. He has a completely robotic skull which his you know, face is then stretched over and everything underneath it isn't real. Which is why the question of, am I even still a human, is such an interesting philosophical quandary to me. And I love that. It exists in a film called Robocop. <laughs> it's so good. This film has so much depth and I love it. Well, it turns out in the end that he is actually human or he considers himself to be. Yes, because the very last line of the original Robocop is, hey, nice shooting, son. What's your name? Call me Murphy. Nice shooting, son. What's your name? Murphy. So, yeah, so finally Robocop has come to terms with his own, like, you know, robo mortality and has said, I am still Alex Murphy, um, if not in body, still in spirit and mind. And I love that. And then they ruin it in one of the sequels. Well, I think at the end of like Robocop 3, which is terrible and no one ever talks about, he tells someone to call him Robocop. You call me Robocop. And this is one of the reasons that I adore Robocop because in universe, nobody is ever able to figure out why. Alex Murphy is just so able to come to terms with the fact he is now a robot mm. because every other person they try to do it to immediately tries to commit suicide in what I think is the best part of Robocop 2. Uh, have you seen Robocop 2? No. Okay, well you will if you edit this video so you'll get to see that, that clip, but they literally make a Robocop 2. And they say, now introducing Robocop 2 and it comes out like a big pots and pans robot. <laughs> All right, so do we know why that doesn't happen to Alex Murphy? Well, it's explored in some detail in like, you know, extended universe material and alluded to in, I think, Robocop 2. And it's simply because Alex Murphy is a Catholic. And people might think, well, I don't remember Alex Murphy's Catholicism being all that big a deal, but it's actually a super huge fucking deal. Yeah. And again, extended universe material reveals that one of the reasons he was handpicked for the Robocop probe. You might think, well, no, it's, no, it's random. Alex Murphy just gets shot 
it's a horrific accident and obviously the Robocop program takes advantage of that. But it's not, because do you remember the start of the movie, Nisha? It's Alex Murphy, he comes in from a safer precinct because he gets relocated. Oh yeah. And who relocates him? OCP, yeah. because OCP run the police. Yeah. And that's one of those little subtle things that no one ever picks up on until you point it out and it you is. like me. <laughs> yeah. But think about that for a moment. It's like, oh, OCP say we need to find a guy who's like, you know, matches the profile that we've got. Show me the files. Next scene, Alex Murphy, I've been, I've been transferred here mm. to the most dangerous precinct in Detroit and he gets shot to death like five minutes later and then they pick him up. And they talk about, like, again, in Extended Universe stuff that, yeah, his psychological profile was perfect for the Robocop program because one, he is like fiercely devoted to duty and has an unflinching sense of justice. And two, he's really, really Catholic. And one of the key tenets of Catholicism is that the most heinous mortal sin one can commit is suicide. And when Alex Murphy wakes up as Robocop, that deep-rooted instinct to preserve his own life at all costs stops him from doing what all the other Robocops did and taking his life. And then he helps him come to terms with like, you know, being a robot. And again, this is, movie, this is a movie called Robot. It's so good. It's like one interesting, like, philosophical thing to explore. Okay, so the reason he doesn't commit suicide is because he is Catholic. Yes, and that allows, like, you know, Robocop to avoid that thing that happens to the, like, you know, Robocop 2 and 3, which is they just can't, like, you know, they'd rather die than live inside the robot body. Whereas Alex Smith's like, well, no, because killing myself is the worst thing I could possibly do. And that allows him to just get over that immediate hump of, holy shit, I'm trapped in this robot body. There aren't many fictional characters who eat shit quite as hard as Emil Antonowski from Robocop. A man who is struck by a Rude Goldberg-esque series of misfortune which results in him having all of his flesh melted off by toxic waste moments before he's hit by a car so hard that he explodes. A scene it turns out that the makers of the movie had to fight to even include in the first place. Okay, so for the people who don't know who or what Robocop is... I don't which get probably it. Like, this is so silly. Like, if you're a fan of the channel, you're a fan of Robocop. And the specific element of that film we're talking about today is the fate of a character called Emil Antonowski, who is one of the antagonists who results in the titular Robocop being turned into a robotic policeman in the first place. And is that scene where Robocop just gets shot by every shotgun in the world? One of the most over-the-top and brutal death scenes in, like, movie history. Yeah, because um, when I first saw it, I was like... How is this going on for so long? How yeah. is he still alive? <laughs> like, he gets shot for so long. There are so, like, there are so many cuts, and each one just establishes that Murphy's just eating shit that little bit harder. So like every additional cut just adds to the agonizing death of Alex Murphy, man. It's so harsh. <laughs> That makes you, though, as an audience, really want the people who did that to Murphy to get theirs. Yeah. And I think of all the people that, like, you know, Robocop ends up killing, like, Emil eats it the hardest because, holy shit, does that guy go down swinging. And I need to break this down for the audience at home. Like, Emil doesn't just die. Like, he melts and then he's exploded into a cloud of pus and viscera. It is so ridiculously over the top. It's amazing and I love it. Ah, How much of the scene do you remember? Like, of like, you know, in specific regards, like what a meal looks like after he's showered with the toxic waste? I, all I remember is like these, this melty face and these yes. like melty hands and then he's like kind of staggering along the road. Yeah, and that effect was like, it was achieved by the same guy who designed the Robocop outfit, one Rob Bertin. All right. who, it may not surprise you to learn, he also did a lot of the effects for the Thing movie. Yeah. Which features like, you know, similar, like, you know, body horror elements. And he says that that effect was one of his favorite to work on his, in his entire career. And he dubbed it the melting man, like very aptly, because he didn't want it to look like, you know, that Emil had been burned by the toxic waste. He wanted it to look like his flesh was sluicing off the bones. Uh, yeah. I'm hoping that as I like say this, there'll be like, you know, a slow-mo clip of just when he lifts his hands up. Yeah. And you can see that. You can see the bones underneath where his fingers are and the flesh is melting off his hand. And then he gets hit by a car and explodes. <laughs> it's so hard! 
bar. She's so bar. <laughs> yeah, if he, if he doesn't have it bad enough already, the melting skin, and then gets hit by a car at full yeah. speed. <laughs> the thing is, though, the car's been driven by his boss. That's what makes it just a little bit worse. It's like, <laughs> the car is being driven. And I think, you know what? That's very applicable to, like, you know, the climate we are in right now of a boss showing so little regard for their own employee's safety and well-being when they're very clearly ill and just hitting them with a car. <laughs> <laughs> like you'd never do that, Carl. You'd never do that. <laughs> You're working from home right now. <laughs> no, he wouldn't let me go in the office. It's fine. And I'm just going to gather from some of the stories I've heard from people like who've been called into work during this literal global pandemic that if they woke up one morning looking like Emil does in that scene, they their boss would still call them in and they wouldn't think it's a good enough excuse. <laughs> Okay, so the scene itself is, we've discussed it, was very brutal and very over the top. Yeah, and I think it's so over the top that it borders on being funny, but you can see why some people might be a little bit, like, you know, made squeamish by that. And you can also probably see why the MPAA wanted that scene excised in, in its entirety from the movie due to the graphic violence on display. <laughs> It's one of them things where, like, you watch it now and you laugh at it. But back then, I think a lot of people would feel sick probably watching it. You can, yeah, and that's like, you know, what the MPAA, they, that's what they argued. It's like, well, this, it's so graphic that people will be made, people will be physically repulsed by this scene. But here's the thing, like, not many people were because, like, the makers of Robocop love that scene so much. They were like, no, fuck you, MPAA. We want this scene in. It's too good. We spent too much money and too much time achieving this effect, and it's fucking hilarious. So what they did is they gathered a bunch of, like, comment cards from early screenings of the film. Yeah. And they sent them to the MPAA, and this is important because on a lot of those comment cards where it asked people, what was your favourite scene in the movie? almost every single person wrote down when that man got hit by the car and exploded. <laughs> like, it was literally the like the favourite moment in the film for almost every single person who watched it, like, you know, early in test screenings. Yeah. And what the makers of Robocop did is they got all those and sent it to the MPAA, who went, but I guess we don't really have a leg to stand on, just like a meal, because how can we argue that this will, like, you know, repulse people and, like, you know, put them off? And it's vulgar to the extent where it just, like, you know, it's an affront to, like, decency. When we have hundreds of comment cards from, like, you know, the average cinema going public, we're ostensibly trying to protect, going, no, it's fucking awesome, leave it in. <laughs> I know, people love gory stuff anyway. The thing is, I'd argue it's, it, it, it's so over the top, it's not even, it's, got, it's just funny. Also, it's really cathartic when you know like, that guy shot Robocop. Like, he shot Alex Miller like 10 times. He deserves to explode. Yeah, he deserves everything he gets. He does. And it's just like, well, the idea that, like, oh no, we need to cut this scene because, like, audiences won't like it. Well, here's a thousand fucking comment cards saying the exact opposite. Oh, I, I guess you better leave it in then. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how that scene made it into the movie. We're going to be talking about Robocop, and I don't. Like, I've not watched too much Robocop. Is Alex Murphy, is it? Whoa, 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 whoa. Lucas, are you saying you work for this channel and you've not watched Robocop? Uh, so, fun fact that I've never told you, I don't think. My it's first really? introduction to Robocop was that awful reboot. No! No! Lucas, go watch Robocop! No! Folks, oh, go watch Robocop, it's awesome! I guess, like, this is an education for us all, then. Yeah, I, I love me some Robocop. I'm going to turn to the Robocop wiki, which does exist, because I found it. And um, yeah, we'll start as we often do at the beginning. So biographical information. Um, Robocop, aliases, Alex Murphy. Affiliations, the Detroit Police Department. Actor, Peter fucking Weller. And then some shit bird in Robocop 3, <laughs> who's not Peter Weller. I, I love Peter Weller, because he's like, the reason he's so good at playing Robocop is because he's a method actor, and he got super fucking into playing Robocop. Oh, God, like... I can't imagine having to just try and method at being a fucking Robocop. He, he did though, he took like yoga lessons and everything. And like he got lessons from a mime about how to move and like be in complete control of your body. Which is why you have the super deliberate robotic like movements of him. And his voice as well, you can't replace that fucking voice. Drop the gun, you are under arrest. They did though, didn't they? They did. And I got really pissed, it's like um, it's Robocop is in Mortal Kombat 11. 
And I remember when that trailer dropped and I just sent you a message, didn't I, Lucas, of, well, I can't go on Twitter for the next two days. <laughs> just right, I'm abandoning social media for a bit. And, like, because I knew that every fucking person who follows the channel, who knows Love Robocop, was going to send me that fucking trailer, which they did. And I remember, like, looking and going, oh, that's Peter Weller. Second one, I knew straight away. That's fucking Peter Weller. And you scroll down to the comments, and like, oh, it looks like Robocop, but the voice is different. It's like, no, Peter Weller's just 30 fucking years older. People's voice changes. Anyway, so OCP Crime Prevention Unit 001, better known as motherfucking Robocop, was a cyborg police officer created by Omni Consumer Products with the remains of the brutally murdered police officer, Alex Murphy. That's fucking rough, isn't it? It was brutal. It is, yeah. Like, getting his fucking, like, arm and his face blown off by, like, just endless shotgun fire. <laughs> it's such a good film because you can watch it as a dumb action movie or you can watch it as, like, a pseudo, like, sci-fi body horror thing. <laughs> of, like, he's a man trapped inside a machine. Like, is he a man? Is he a machine? And that's, like, the inner turmoil of Robocop. And if I sound like I'm sniffing my own farts about Robocop, fuck you, I love Robocop. And so we'll move swiftly on to some background information about Robocop when the OCP Security Concepts Project at ED209. And I don't like how it's canonically ED209. To me, it's ED209. I like that it's called ED. <laughs> Ran into serious delays and cost overruns, the old man, who's a character in the film, referred to only as the old man, ordered a backup plan. Bob Morton took the assignment. So OCP restructured the Detroit Police Department with prime candidates according to risk factor as another victim of criminality was soon expected to be found. After receiving the call from the emergency room, the scientists and surgeons at Security Concepts swung into action, harvesting what was left of the brutally slain police officer Alex Murphy's organic components. Part of his digestive tract and what was left of his brain, several organs in his left arm, I won't kid you when there's not enough left on a flight for a fucking corpse. The left arm was later amputated at the behest of Morton, effectively turning Murphy remains into the OCP Crime Prevention Unit 001, or Robocop. And it's just, it's so fucking harsh. Yeah. Technology. The OCP Crime Prevention Unit 001 was afforded the fastest reflexes made possible by modern technology, a memory assisted by an onboard computer and program with a lifetime experience in on-the-street law enforcement. And also, you know, supplemented by just like Alex Murphy being a fucking don. Prime directives, fundamental to Robocop's operational limits, were the prime directives, a set of rules, unbreakable and unbendable, that Robocop is bound to uphold. And these are serve the public trust, protect the innocent, and uphold the law. And I really like those as um, just a variation on Asimov's free laws. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think they're a good, like, you no know, tooling of them, spe like, specifically tailored towards a police officer. Because they sound really simple, but you think that's all you need. That's all realistically a police officer should need to be told. It's like, serve the public trust, like, do what is ever in the public interest. You know, protect the innocent, uphold the fucking law, because that is you. Yeah. And then you have the secret fourth directive, which is do not harm a member of OCP, but that's hidden inside. Oh, uh, right, of course it is, yeah. And then you have a, like, a great scene in Robocop 2, where they put like 500 fucking like, directives in his head. And that are all stuff like stop people from littering and teach kids um, uh, not to cuss. Oh, no. And then you have, like, a great scene of him just on the street saying, Now, children, come around and I will tell us a story as they're, like, throwing bricks in. <laughs> <laughs> and Robocop realised, no, I can't fucking deal with this. So he just goes and punches a Transformer, fries his own brain and reboots. Oh, God. Yeah, he reboots himself and he just comes back up, watching the directive, protects everyone, uphold the fucking law. It, and then he's explained here in more detail, when Dr. Juliet Fax gave Robocop so many directives, they all but paralysed him against taking any action at all. He deliberately short-circuited himself and thereby erased all of his directives, undoing her sabotage, and relying on his human mentality as a police officer to guide him. Oh, I forgot about that. So he, he gets rid of all of them, but because Alex Murphy's a fucking police officer, he doesn't need the directives. Because he's now a man. Well, it's weird that um, the idea of, well, we need to have, like, the human brain to, you know, run the Robocop armor, mm -hmm. but then they just make him like a robot anyway, and it's like, you follow these three rules. Like, well, what's the point that. of making it a human brain? Just make a robot. Well, yeah, well, they have that. Oh, that's what they want to do with, like, ED-209. Oh, uh, okay. It's like, you need that, um, like that human uh, parameter to the law, because obviously, like... Um, 
the law is not black and white. There are like shades of grey there, and that's when you need that like the human touch there, mm-hmm. um, like so to like make the judgment. And then Robocop realised, no, I don't fucking need any of this shit. I'm Alex Murphy. So we <laughs> weapons, and we have potentially one of the coolest fucking guns in fiction, the Auto 9. Robocop's primary weapon, the Auto 9, remains stored in a mechanical hol- holster, which deployed from his right leg. It was modified so that it would not fire unless Robocop was the one using it. Oh, okay, yeah. And it's like the coolest fucking gun. I, I love it so much. Because it's just so big. <laughs> It's so fucking massive. Like you have, like, there's a great scene like the first Robocop where it's like him just at the firing range and it's just this like cannon of a gun just <laughs> obliterating fucking targets as he just smashes the high score. Oh, the terminal strip. Robocop's terminal strip was a sharp, spike-like device that protruded from his right fist. This device could be used by Robocop to interface with corresponding data port in order to download information from the police database. And it's basically just, Lucas, um, a USB that you stab Oh, okay. Just, well, do they have just, a thing where he might get it upside down? No, that's the thing. The, the uh, Not only did Robocop predict USBs, they made one that's better than an actual USB because it can be used in any direction. <laughs> also, it can be used as a knife because he used it to stab somebody. Oh, God, what does he download then? Whatever he wants. I, I just love the idea, though, that like, he just has a fist knife that downloads data. It's great. Perception! Robocop had an internal zoom capability for better aim as well as tracking. He also had different vision modes. His system used a grid which was crucial to his targeting as well as bullet trajectory, allowing him to make ricochet shots. Oh, okay. That's cool. So you have you have a great shot in, I think it's Robocop 2, where he bounces a bullet off a wall and hits a guy when he's holding a hostage. Um, his mind could record anything he saw, meaning that his uh, memory was admissible as evidence in a court of law. <laughs> Which is when you get one of the best fucking scenes of just Bodica getting dressed down that, by Dick Jones. Like, you fucking idiot, you confess to Robocop. And he's like, and? He's a robot, dickhead, he remembers everything. <laughs> body structure. Robocop's body, while incorporating portions of Alex Murphy's remaining, oh god, that's rough, living tissue, was largely electronical and mechanical. This interior structure was protected by titanium, and an armoured shell um, composite laminated with Kevlar, making Robocop incredibly resilient to both bullets and bombs, as well as extreme impacts as being hit by cars, falling off of skyscrapers, and other damage he could see in the line of duty. One of the best scenes is like when he um, gets attacked by every police officer in Detroit, and it is him stood as like 50 police officers like just fire unlimited machine gun bullets at him, and he just holds his hand up and walks away. <laughs> He's like, how do you beat this man? You don't. The armour was also highly resistant to heat as Robocop was unaffected after being caught in a gas station explosion or being set on fire. His visor was made of the same bulletproof material and had a black strip of bulletproof anti-fog glass which protected the cranium apparatus and his eyes. The visor also had an undercloth of Kevlar which protected the neck and covered up any wires. So, when the visor was removed, only the front of Alex Murphy's face from the top of the neck up was exposed to the back. However, his head was entirely mechanical. It says here that uh, Robocop's hand was strong enough to crush every bone in the human arm, um, with um, relatively little force being exerted. Uh, disadvantages. Despite all of Robocop's technological advances, he was still limited to mechanical maintenance, which meant he needed servicing and tune-ups. <laughs> yeah, he needs, to get, fucking, needs to get his fucking eyes debugged. It's like, oh, well, what are you doing today, Robocop? I'm going in for my MOT, see if my suspension still works. <laughs> Despite his impressive reflexes, his overall locomotion was slow. He was never seen running. Meaning that he could not chase a fleeing suspect on foot only by a vehicle. That's the worst part. Like if you just run away from Robocop, he's not going to get you. But I like it in the sense that he's like the Terminator in that way. Like you'll run away, but he will find you. Like even if he's walking very slow, he will get catch up to you eventually because he does not tire. Yeah, and that's the thing. The bullets will get you eventually, don't worry. And that's about as much interesting information I feel we can plumb from the Robocop wiki. But fucking hell do I love me some Robocop. Like just the fact that he's, just, he's a robot policeman. Like, like, we can show it off right now. Oh, God, I just realised as well while I've been recording. Um, God, fucking green screen's one. I, I can show her before we end. This is how much I love Robocop. I'm going to go through to the other room. I'm going to go through to my office. <laughs> I'm now in my office in the other room, which is where I edit like, those videos. And I'm going to show people what, this is what hangs above my office. Like, this is what is looking over me at all times when I'm working. It is this po- <laughs> this poster of Robocop. <laughs> I just have, whenever I'm working, Robocop is there with me. That's how much I fucking love this film. 
Robocop is a film in which the reanimated remains of a brutally slain Detroit police officer are slapped inside of a robot body and instructed to shoot crime directly in the penis. Realised entirely using practical effects, almost everything about the original design of Robocop was changed to accommodate actor Peter Weller, when it dawned on filmmakers that he couldn't do, well, anything in costume. Something epitomised by the fact that the single most difficult shot to realise in the entire film is one of Robocop catching a set of keys. A moment that is literally one second of the film's runtime. So, Carl, you know everything about Robocop. Uh, pretty much, yeah. I, I don't even fucking need the rest of the article to talk about this. Like, this is where the article is so people like, I don't even fucking need this shit. Like, but it's, it's just covering up like, all the recording equipment we have here. Like, um, I, yeah, I know um, pretty much everything about the production of this film front to back. Um, so what do you want now? What's going on? <laughs> what is this article on? about? Well, this article is about the fact it took an entire day to film um, a one second shot, which has uh, um, since been regarded as the single most difficult shot in the entire film to realize, which is Robocop catching a set of keys. But the scene in question takes place during the introduction of Robocop, and it follows like one of my favorite scenes in the movie, which is the firing range scene, um, and that's just Robocop just annihilating um, the high score on just like the firing range with the Auto 9, the coolest fucking gun ever. Anisha, have you seen Robocop? Well, I'm guessing you have, because you have to, like, watch it for all the videos you've made about it. <laughs> so I've, I've seen numerous clips, and I've watched the, the whole film, the first one. I ain't seen any more. Well, that's Just the, the first one. We only need to watch the first one. I'm guessing you're, like, you're familiar with the scene I'm talking about. I know the introduction of Robocop, where you have, like, you know, that really great, just establishing of Robocop as a character, where you just see hints of him as he's walking through the police station, and you have, like, the other police officers there trying to catch a glimpse of this fucking, just autonomous crime fighting robot that's going to replace them where he's like walking down a corridor and it's like you have all these police officers in the way scrambling to get a view at him like you know basically you know the audience standing so that's like you know you the audience also want to see robocop and you, know, you want to know like, what does this look like who is this badass like what what does alex murphy look like now it's like fucking hell he looks awesome and I've talked at great length before about how robocop might be one of the greatest practical effects ever because just you fully 100% buy Robocop as a robot from second one. And that is due to a combination of the just phenomenal practical effects themselves, the sound design, which I think like deserves a nod in of itself, because it's like every single one of Robocop's steps is accompanied by like that robotic like that is so, so good and so just it's excellent. And then you have just like Peter Weller's acting, which is why filming that scene was really hard. So why would Peter Weller's acting make catching keys so difficult? Uh, well, that's because Peter Weller's acting as Robocop underwent a series of dramatic changes. Because initially, um, Peter Weller's idea for portraying Robocop was for him to be very live, very agile, very like graceful in his movements. And he spent several months working with a professional mime coach who'd worked under like Marcel Marceau, like you know, the greatest mime ever. And his thinking was that Robocop as a machine would move with absolute efficiency, which he very quickly realized was not possible when he first put the Robocop costume on. Because the moment he put the costume on, he realized he could not move. Because it was just too bulky. And all of the time he spent working with that mime coach was essentially worthless because he couldn't fucking move. Oh no. And uh, according to Peter Weller, like, yeah, the moment he put the suit on, he legitimately thought this film's not going to get made because it took, I think, upwards of 10 hours to get him into the costume for the first time and he couldn't even walk. 10 hours to get in it? 10 hours to get into it. They got it down to about four or five hours by the end of production, but it took him like 10 hours to get into the Robocop costume for the first time. And the special effects artist who created the costume, Rob Bettine, um, was apparently sweating bullets because he'd spent months making this costume and it was perfectly fitted to Peter Weller's body, and then Peter Weller got into it and couldn't move. So they had to take out almost everything from the internals of the costume to give Peter Weller more freedom of movement. And even then, he still could not move with any sense of purpose, let alone grace. And he quickly realized, I, I, I need to go back to a drawing board um, in regards to how I'm approaching how Robocop will move. And his solution was to lean into the limitations of the suit and instead of Robocop moving with inhumanly perfect precision he decided that Robocop would move like in a more deliberate fashion which is where like the Robocop walk comes from and I contend that Peter Weller's acting as Robocop in costume just is one of the best examples of just robotic acting ever and that's like kind of an oxymoron it's like it's good acting because he's acting robotic but 
when I see any shot of Peter Weller walking as Robocop, I 100% buy Robocop as a machine. The pertinent piece of information we've mentioned is that it took 10 hours for Peter Weller to get into costume initially, and that the costume was very bulky and severely limited his movements, um, which included his ability to catch a set of keys. So why couldn't he catch this set of keys? Uh, because the Robocop gloves were made of foam rubber. And whenever he tried to catch the keys, the keys would bounce out of his hand. <laughs> and according to Peter Weller and people who worked on the film, getting that one shot, which is literally one second long, took all day. Oh my God. Keep in mind that it took him 10 hours to get into costume. Because this was I think that was the very first shot they filmed of Robocop. It's not the first appearance of Robocop in the film, but you know, films aren't always filmed in order. Um, and that was the very first day of shooting with the Robocop costume. And it said it took 10 hours to get him into costume and it took them the rest of the day to get that one second shot. Can you imagine just like, yeah, just being in that costume for hours and hours and hours yep. and just getting one one second shot you've got, all day? You've got one second of usable footage. And it reminds me of that great Simpsons bit where it's like, oh, Millhouse, we need to do the Jiminy Gillica scene again. It's like, we got it. It took 10 hours, but we got it. It's like, yeah, but we need to do it again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And he's like, ah, so that's what acting is. But we've got to do it from different angles. Again and again. And again, and again, and again. Ah! And that's what it was for Peter Weller. Like he said, it was inf- like, you know, he was infuriated because it, it took him literally all day to get one second of footage. And he's like, look, we can't do this. So they took it back to a drawing board and they filmed like more Murphy stuff. Yeah. With him out of costume and like, while well, they like, like overhauled the design of the costume to make it easy to move around it. And even when they did that, he still was like severely like restricted in what he could do. Uh, for example, like he couldn't get into a car. Like the literal poster for Robocop showed Robocop getting out of a car. Like I have this poster on my wall at home. The other one of like, you know, him stood like one foot in a police car, one foot out, just staring directly forward, like one of the most iconic shots in the film, uh, they couldn't do that <laughs> because the costume was so bulky, Peter Weller could not get into a car. Oh, God. So they had to edit around that fact. And fun fact for the audience at home, if you watch the film, uh, every shot of Robocop in a car, Peter Weller's not wearing pants. He's not wearing <laughs> the bottom half of the costume. <laughs> and the only example from film I can think of that sounds more frustrating than that moment for Peter Weller of like all day to get one second of footage. Um, is the final fight scene from Legend of a Drunken Master, I think it is, um, a film I've talked about before, and like widely considered one of the greatest fight scenes ever put to film. It took months to make, and according to Jackie Chan, they would get four seconds of usable footage every single day. Yeah, and I can't imagine how annoyed that'd be. Similar, like, you know, I can only imagine it's like you know a similar experience like what Peter Weller felt mm-hmm. after like you know ten hours of like agonizing makeup, walking in and then spending like another seven hours in the costume under like blazing lights to get a shot and it's like, okay, so how much usable footage do we have? One second. So here at Fact Fiend, we've made it a mission to discuss every facet of the production of the movie Robocop. And in keeping with that idea, today we're discussing um, one particular element of the Robocop mythos, particularly his gun, the Auto 9, and the fact that it resulted in all the people making the movie having to use three times as much blood. Is that a good intro? And we don't drink as much as in these videos, but now Brad's back in Sheffield, like, you know, the bad influence is back. <laughs> the bad influence. All that professional stuff we had set up, Scott. It's the Brad influence. <laughs> the Brad influence. I like that behind the scenes law. We thought I'm back at the gym now, so I can drink more. Anyway, Robocop, what do you all know about the Auto 9? It's like, what do you know about the gun? Have you seen, like, you've seen the film, or you've seen clips, yeah, what I've seen shoot it, yeah. It's like a triple burst <laughs> pistol, isn't it? Yes, uh, and it's known in Robocop canon as the Auto 9. And it's one of the most badass things in fiction, I think. Like, as fictional guns go, it's one of my favourite. And me being a huge nerd for, like, behind-the-scenes Robocop stuff, like, the in-universe lore for the Auto 9 makes no sense. For example, it has a 50-round magazine. But it yes. has three shots? Yes. Did you just do some ma- I'm not doing that math, but does someone want to do that math? On, like, how many bullets are left over for the three-round burst? Would it be? Yeah, 48 is divisible by three. Okay, so we'd have two bullets left over. But also, does that gun lock like it carries 50 fucking bullets? It'd have a magazine like it's long. <laughs> like, do you know what in like what Modern Warfare 2, where you get was like the Rafikas and stuff, and you put like the extended mags on, it's like all the way down here. Could it be that the bullets are inside his arm? They are not inside his arm, no, but the gun itself is housed within Robocop's own body. Oh, it's in his leg, isn't it? Yep, it's yeah. held inside of his leg, which they never show um, in any full profile shot of um, uh, 
uh, Peter Weller in costume, they built a separate leg prop that the gun would slide into and out of, and they just had Peter Weller's hand put the gun in. What's in his other leg? Um, it depends, depending on which version of Robocop you're watching, but he can keep... He doesn't have a knife, but he has mines, um, and like other police, you know, equipment. I feel like you could make a joke video out of like, what is in Robocop's other leg? <laughs> it's just like, trying to think of the most ridiculous thing. A car. Well, he's already got a car. No, his police car comes in, out of his leg. He's like a transformer. <laughs> his leg. leg. He takes a panel off his leg and it turns into a car. There's so much stuff inside of Robocop because, you know, he's like the ultimate perfect Like police love. Officer. Like, yeah, well, he's got his human parts. Alex Murphy's still in there and he loves his wife. You don't see her much, but he does. It's one of the things that, you know, that like, helps him hold on to his humanity. But yeah, he's got his gun inside of his leg. And uh, one of the reasons why it's said to have a 50 round magazine is because director Paul Verhoeven did not want Robocop to reload on screen. He thought that would detract from the action. So you virtually never see Robocop reload, except for a couple of shots um, where they quickly pan away or cut away because they didn't want to include that in the movie. So as a result, they had to explain, well, why does the gun just seemingly fire forever? It's got 50 rounds. But it's like this big. It's tiny. <laughs> don't, don't worry They're about very it. very small it's, rounds. It's the film logic, isn't it? Like, uh, don't mm. ask questions, just agree. <laughs> but the, the amount of like extra stuff inside Robocop, I think my favourite one is just the ram bolts he has in his legs. Of like when he's just stood on the street, he can like anchor himself to the floor. <laughs> Uh, in regards to the Auto 9, like, within Robocop lore, like, he is the, the perfect police officer, despite the fact he can walk at like one mile an hour. And so I feel it'd be really easy to escape from Robocop. I love the films, but all you need to do is just move faster than a guy walking. He's got to have like that, um, that's Michael Myers tech though. No, no. Like, he, he does get a jetpack in the third movie. <laughs> so I guess that'd be one thing. That he does can drive. things a bit. You know, you run, the, the criminal runs around the corner and they think they've escaped and he's right behind, right on your tail. That's well, I guess, yeah. He, all, he does only have like 24 hours of battery life. But you know, that's besides the point. But within, is, that, is that true? Yeah, he uh, can operate for 24 hours before recharging. Imagine <laughs> run out during a fight. Yeah, he can also starve to death. Oh, shit. Yeah, because he's got rudimentary organs. Up. Anyway, we've talked about that in other videos. But <laughs> in regards to the Auto 9 within the Robocop universe, like, it is like in Alex Murphy's hands, that is the perfect weapon. Because he has like, you know, the laser targeting system, and that combined with the fact he's 100% completely immune to gunfire himself means that he can just walk through a room full of people shooting guns at him and just shoot them all in the penis. So something I didn't mention in the intro because I don't know why I forgot to mention it, but Robocop's gun is actually illegal in real life. And would you like to hazard a guess about why Robocop was using an illegal crime gun to fight crime? Wait, to clarify, was the prop that they made for the film illegal? Yes. Or in universe, was the gun he was using not legal? Um, in our universe, the prop that Alex Murphy, Peter Weller, was using as Alex Murphy was illegal. Do you have to hazard a guess about why? It was like no safety. No, it had a safety. Like, you know, last thing, it was a real gun. And again, we have to like go to the uh, double check. It is um, a modified Beretta M93R. Because it's modified, maybe it's something. Well, I mean, it's, te it's technically close to automatic, isn't it? Because it could fire three rounds, and it could fire three rounds in a semi-automatic fashion, which technically, on paper, made the Auto 9, like, you know, when it had been constructed by prop makers, um, the equivalent of an assault weapon. <laughs> because, like, you, as you mentioned there, you could fire three rounds as quickly as you could pull the trigger, which is not a thing you should probably put in the hands of civilians. And even though it was a prop that could fire blanks, you can just swap those blanks out for a real gun. Then you've got a very dangerous thing. But in specific regards to the Auto 9, in addition to causing trouble for production, just getting the gun into the country, it also caused trouble for the special effects crew because the Auto 9 fires three bullets. And as a result of firing three bullets, they had to use literally three times as many squibs for every person Robocop shot. So every time Robocop shot somebody, they had to load them with three times the amount of squibs they would ordinarily use because they had to replicate them being hit by three bullets at once all within a small um, area. Ah! And there's a great behind the scenes bit where like with the special effects supervisor is like holding up an entire bag of blood of like, this is what we normally use for like, you know, an entire shootout in another movie. What are you doing with it? Oh, we put it on one guy. <laughs> Just one guy gets shot by Robocop because that's how fucking OP powerful this gun is. And these are extra large blood bags, but in a lot of the sequences, that's how much blood we use. 
with three or four of the bullet hits to get the, the blood gushing and spurting off the chest cavity and the body cavities. Uh, but yeah, that's how Robocop's gun caused a bunch of problems behind the scenes. Oh, I never win anything. Um, but yeah, so I'd like to uh, say a big shout out to all the people who helped me work on this amazing TV show called Untitled Side TV Show. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I have a... <coughs> Sorry. Bless you. You there in the audience. <laughs> um, yes, I have uh, quite a few people to thank. Um, start off with uh, people who were very supportive and uh, who helped me get through this quite challenging role it's jub jub 366 tyler mason and andy roffle thank you and um, i'd also like to thank andy ellis for giving me a personal foot massage every evening yep <laughs> hannon doa argo thank you for being there and showing me cat memes every night Zeron King and Nick, thank you so much for making sure I didn't go on TikTok binges till the early hours. <laughs> thank you to Kim Geisler, Fiora Lily and Calorian, who always said I look good in blazers. Thank you to Bubba P, Eric Toledo and Lyndon B. Johnson for always being there with grapes, a fan and, you know, a non-stop supply of amaretto. Aww. CD Bad, Mile High Farm D, thank you so much for being there to pull my hair back when I'm being sick because I've drank too much amaretto. <laughs> Thank you to Binger for always being there to give me piggybacks into work. Anna Goo and Alicia for taking it in turns for wiping my arse when I went to the toilet. <laughs> Sarah Paul and the Red Oak Shield Virus for taking it in turns to basically be my puppet master and move my arms and my mouth when I could not be arse. Thank you to Jake and... Jake and... <laughs> Why can't I read names? Thank you to Jacob. <laughs> Thank you to Jacob Ersenbach and G for both writing the script for me. And finally, thank you to Cal Tessa for holding me up the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake, Cal Tessa. Anyway. <sighs> that didn't hurt. Uh, yeah, so if you want your name to be read out in a ridiculous way like this, you can join on Patreon as a patron and support the channel. And yeah, we can, you can exp Why is Carl getting undressed when I'm trying to do this? <laughs> so if you want your name. You want your name? Just be distracted. Join on Patreon, we'll give you it back. You're the first Carl naked body is distracting. Oh God. He's distracting our pilot in time. Have I ever seen this song? It is very pale. I mean, I'm not, I, all I can see is the light, so it is very pale. Yeah, we don't it's have very light, light. It's just Carl's body reflecting. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you would like your name read out in a ridiculous manner like this, you can join the Patreon and become a patron and support us so we can continue making fact mean, fact mean like style videos. And yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks. Woo! Yeah. Woo!